Hi folks, I'm Tatiana Stanton and I'm doing the third part of a um, series of short talks that Rich, um, Toby and Nico Kochendorfer and myself are doing on um, nutrition in sheep and goats. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, And as usual, I have all this stuff blocking my slideshow. Okay. Okay. So as we talked about, goats and sheep are small ruminants. Um, they get their food, and then as it gets um, comes into the reticulum rumen um, compartment, it um, the heavier mat is is pushed back up and re regurgitated and chewed some more until it finally gets fined enough that it goes out. Um, the papilla, um, there's the protrusions on the rumen. Um, as the micro as the microorganisms there break down the um, fibers fiber and the sugars and starches there, you get um, the vol volatile fatty acids are released and those are absorbed through the rumen wall. Uh, and as Nico mentioned um, last week, um, those from fiber are primarily made into acetic acid, which contributes a lot to milk fat production and stuff but it's less effective at producing energy than the um, propionic acid that's produced more from, through, from, your, uh, from your other carbohydrates, what we're used to thinking of carbohydrates as far as your non-structural. So, um, and then you've got your butyric, which is used more to make ketone bodies, um, which also serve as an energy source, but less efficiently. Again, than the glucose that is yielded from the um, from the propionic um, acid. And I'm going to try and go to the next slide. And as usual, it's giving me trouble advancing. Okay. So again, they're small ruminants. Their digestive system is designed to obtain energy from the volatile fatty acids that are produced by the fermentation of plant tissue by the rumen microorganisms. And um, this is a slide courtesy of Larry Chase, and it's just showing a plant cell wall um, and, or a plant cell. And you have the cell wall, which is your structural, contains primarily your structural carbohydrates as far as your cellulose, your hemicellulose, and your lignin. Um, and it also contains pectin, uh, but pectin, um, while it's a non-structural carbohydrate, it behaves a lot when it's fermented like a um, structural carbohydrate um, in that it tends to yield acetic acid. Um, so these cell walls, um, Carbohydrates are primarily called your, or are your primarily structural carbohydrates, and those are what we, what are your fi what what fiber is. So in a ruminant animal, these are carbohydrates because they're able to be broken down to yield those those volatile fatty acids. And then inside the cell wall, you've got your starches and your sugars, um, and these would be your structure your non-structural carbohydrates and they're gonna yield more your propionic um, acid. Um, and then you also inside this cell wall or, or inside the cell would have your um, proteins. And some of the proteins are gonna be bonded into condensed tannin um, complexes if the, plant, if the plant contains condensed tannins. Okay, so that's all pretty much a review. Um, and your structural carbohydrates, which are your fiber in a ruminant animal, unlike in a human, are the primary source of energy, or at least your plant fiber, your plant tissues are. Um, they help, your fiber helps to maintain a healthy rumen function. 
uh, and you tend to have fewer digestive problems when sheep and goats are forage fed. Um, and these, pro these volatile fatty acids help maintain the rumen at proper pH and encourage your papillary um, development. Um, and when we're looking at our forage, um, forage analysis nowadays, um, they used to do crude fiber and that was a, um, crude fiber was originally created in the days of um, making, you know, clothing and stuff from fiber where they would use um, an acid to break that, get rid of the hemicellulose and they would use a um, base, something that was very, um, uh, alkaline to get rid of the lignin and that would leave your cellulose which they would then use um, to make clothing with and stuff you know as far as your flax for linen and stuff like that um, but it wasn't it it isn't a very accurate measurement of what fiber is actually there and instead nowadays we'll use ndf and ndf would be your lignin and your hemicellulose and your cellulose um, Initially, that would also include ash in there and some of the proteins that were bonded to the fiber. Um, but nowadays, if you see OM, you know, for a while there, they would put OM on the NDF, you know, they'd put OM. And that just meant that it was adjusted for the ash. The ash was removed. It, it had a correction for the ash there, so ash wasn't included there. And then the amylase uh, is an enzyme that's used to get rid of those proteins that are bonded. And so now and that nowadays you'll sometimes see a little A NDF. And basically that's, you know, nowadays almost all the NDFs you're going to see on a feed sample or on a forage sample are, are already adjusted for the amylase. They're essentially that little A NDF. Okay. And also that OM. And then we have our ADF. And so in the case of those, you're using a neutral detergent. Um, a neutral detergent soap to um, to such as you know an example in humans for that humans use would be you know your baby shampoos and stuff. You're using that to uh, dissolve um, everything but the fiber out of there. And then when you do ADF, you're then going on and using using a strong acid on it uh, to get rid, and that is leaving you with your lignin and cellulose. So neither of these methods really separates out just the lignin alone. And to try and separate out the lignin alone, which the big problem with your lignin is that's not digestible. Unlike the cellulose and the hemicellulose, it's not digestible by the rumen microorganisms. Um, and it's actually very difficult to figure out. And so that's why we do some estimates such as the fermentable fiber, um, um, calculation that I'll show in a few minutes is that it's actually somewhat problematic to get out lignin. And then the problem we always have is that lignin is forms bonds with the cellulose and with the and it can also form bonds with that hemicellulose or with protein. So it's um, it's always difficult based on a lab test to tell how digest um, how much fiber is actually there that is indigestible or infermentable. Um, so your non-structural carbohydrates are also in your plant tissue, uh, as we just pointed out, within the cell itself. And that's why when you chew on a grass stem, you know, you'll often find, you'll often taste sweet, uh, especially if it's a younger stem. And they're also called your non-fiber carbohydrates, or, um, and for humans, these would be your carbohydrates. And they're mainly starches and sugars, uh, and again, they ferment primarily in the propionic and butyric acid. Um, however, if you've got excessive amounts of sugar and starch there, it encourages the growth of your lactic acid producing bacteria in the rumen. And unfortunately, lactic acid is much more acidic than your propionic or your acidic or your acid, uh, acidic or your butyric um, acid. And so this can make the rumen too acidic, okay? And because of that, you then get a risk of rumen acidosis. So it's a careful balance of how much starch and sugar the rumen can actually tolerate. And then as I pointed out earlier, pectin behaves similarly to fermentable fiber, even though it is a non-structural carbohydrate and it produces primarily acidic acid. Um, 
and I'm simplifying things and I apologize for that. Goats and sheep are small ruminants, so therefore they have a rapid rate of passage of food through their rumens compared to cows. Um, and so they're not gonna utilize mature, um, highly fibrous forage as well as cows will. And therefore the fermentable fiber, what can be fermented in the rumen um, content of a feed is very important. And fermentable fiber is simply the name for fiber that your rumen microbes can digest. Um, and, we, and the small ruminants are also very dependent on the non-structural carbohydrates in good quality forage in, and in the other feeds we give them. And the goal is to stimulate your feed intake by maintaining good rumen health while still, still using feeds that are readily digested in the rumen. Um, so feeds that are high in fermentable fiber or an NSC and that readily pass from the rumen to make root space for additional feed to enter um, and therefore help keep your feed intake up. An indigestible fiber such as lignin takes up space, stays in the rumen and, and lowers the feed intake. Okay, so why is any of this important? We're often trying, attempting to increase feed consumption by lowering the NDF in the diet and increasing the NSC. Um, and this can lead, unfortunately, to serious problems such as rumen acidosis, enterotoxemia, and also possibly to milk fat depression, or also can lead to milk fat depression. And the misconception, there's a misconception that increasing NDF past a certain level needed for proper rumen function will result in lower feed intake. But the problem is that not all NDF is the same, not all neutral detergent fiber behaves the same in the, in the rumen. And that's because the lignin levels vary widely in it, okay? It, as we said, it contains all three components of fiber in NDF, and we don't know how much of that's lignin versus how much is hemicellulose and cellulose. And, Hogan, and Doug Hogue and Mike Tony found that when they did it, um, different equations to try and explain you know, the curve of how much would be consumed by an animal or how much intake you would have as you um, increase NDF, that even with a quadratic, which would allow for that curve, they only got 17% of the variation in dry matter intake explained. Um, versus when they looked at NDF and divided it into the fermentable portion of NDF and an indigestible portion, using the equation I'll be showing, the model, the quadratic model then explained 57% of the variation in dry matter intake. So it did a much better job of explaining it. So because of this, you know, Mike Tony really was pushed to start looking at fermentable NDF rather than just at NDF alone. Okay, so here's the equation. Um, Basically, we're just looking at neutral the total neutral detergent fiber you have there and subtracting from it the indigestible portion. And we calculate the indigestible portion by looking at 100 minus your total digestible nutrients or your digestible dry matter. So that would give you what wasn't digested. And then from what wasn't digested, we take out what's going to go out in the fecal in, in your feces no matter what. So we just subtract from that what's gonna go out in the feces no matter what, and that leaves you with what was indigestible. And um, the fecal me metabolic loss varies a little depending on how concentrated that energy source is, that grain is. And so we use these, you know, just ballpark estimates of 15% for forages and down to 10% for grains like corn and, and barley, okay? And so this is just an equation using the equation and for a sample of wheat mids, this would be a sample that's actually quite high in NDF. Um, in, in, for, in NDF um, where you've got an NDF percentage of 43, that total digestible nutrients of 80. Um, we're using, because it's a byproduct feed, we're using 12% uh, as the estimate of the fecal met metabolic loss. 
you end up with a fermentable NDF, a potential fermentable NDF of 35%. And the way, reason we say it's potential is depending on how high the feed intake is, the rate of passage of food, food through the rumen is going to go faster if you've got a high feed intake. And so that is going to, the, the rumen microorganisms are going to have less chance to work on the, um, on the feed that you're giving them on, the, on these wheat mids. And so therefore, it's, it, you may not get as much fermentable fiber yielded as the potential was. Okay, so depending on how fast it's moving through there, the faster it's moving through, that you get a loss, some loss of efficiency in breaking down that fermentable fiber. And then if we look at shell corn, it's got a lot lower NDF on it. It's got a lot higher total digestible nutrients. And now we're using an esti a ballpark estimate of 10% for the fecal metabolic loss. And so you're only getting a potential fermentable NDF of 8%. So you can see that with the corn, if you were feeding your animal just corn, you would have a huge chance of rumen acidosis versus feeding them something, you know, feeding your wheat mids, where you'd have a lot less chance of rumen acidosis. Okay, so now if we look at the potential fermentable NDF or potential fermentable fiber in common feeds. Um, here's a list here. And in this list, we're pretty sure that Doug Hogue went in here and gave it a little boost if things had, were high in pectin. He made that assumption that if there's more pectin there, it's gonna be a little higher. Um, but if you look at the soy hulls here, they've got an NDF of 70%, excuse me. Um, versus the oat hulls have an NDF, have an NDF of 78%. So you would say, if we're just looking at NDF alone, we would say that both of these should really negatively impact your feed intake. They should bulk up the rumen and be pretty in, indigestible and, um, and they're gonna slow down the rate, the rate of passage of food and therefore slow down the feed intake. But then if you look instead at this column here, which is your indigestible NDF, you can say that whole soy hulls are very low in indigestible um, fiber. Almost all the fiber in them is highly fermentable, is highly usable by those um, rumen microorganisms to yield uh, your volatile fatty acids. Whereas in con contrast, the indigestible, um, Oat, oat hulls have very high indigestible um, NDF. And this, I think these two were used to substitute out for each other in that study that Ho, Doug Hogue and Mike Tony did looking at um, why NDF was not nearly as good an explainer of um, feed intake as fermentable fiber was. And then if you look at fermentable fiber, you can see that um, soy hulls yield uh, substantially more fermentable fiber than your oat hulls do. Okay. Okay. And early lactation guidelines for sheep, and these hold out pretty good for goats. If you look at the three lamb level, um, they hold out pretty well for um, meat goats that are nursing large litters and also for um, dairy goats. Um, you can see that we talk about the minimum um, potential fermentable fiber going up from about 22% up to about 30%, depending on how much milk production you're asking that animal to produce. And then um, crude protein going up from about 14% to 16%. Okay. Um, I'm now gonna branch out into protein for a little while. And so your dietary protein, as far as the animal is concerned, is supplied by amino acids in the feed. And excess protein can't be stored in the body. Uh, instead, it's used fairly inefficiently as, as a conversion into energy if there's excess. And then it's also secreted in the urine. Um, and however, if dietary protein is compromised in a doe in late pregnancy, doe, um, and this is the same with ewes, 
they have the ability, these late pregnant animals have the ability to mobilize the amino acids from their actual skeleton, skeletal muscle tissue and organs to supply the needs of their placentas and the fetuses. Um, and, and the fetal placental unit actually uses a large amount of the dam circulating amino acids. Uh, rather than using a lot of glucose from the dam, one of their main sources of uh, energy for, for the feed, fetus and for growth of that fetus is the circulating amino acids. And then the rumen microorganisms actually can utilize these mineral sources of nitrogen as well. And so we can also feed the animal a small amount of non-protein nitrogen um, in the form of say, urea used to be one that was popular and you wanted to limit it to about one to 2% of the, um, the of the diet of the commercial concentrate you were feeding. And then keep in mind that ammonia chloride, which we often include to acidify the urine um, to, for male animals to try and prevent urinary calculi or help prevent it, is also a type of NPN. Okay. And so again, just a reminder that your proteins are in the within the cell, and some of those are free. And some of those are bonded in your condensed tannin complexes. Unfortunately, some of those are also bonded with your lignin. Okay. So I'm really simplifying things, but basically we have two types of protein uh, when it enters the rumen, as far as the rumen microorganisms are concerned. We have the rumen degradable protein, and this is gonna be broken down by those microbes, or is able to be broken down by them as long as they have sufficient amounts of, of carbohydrates. So it's similar to a compost pile. It needs a certain amount of carbon in order to break down that, ni those, that nitrogen. Um, and they, these rumen microbes use, the, use those amino acids and that, and those ni and that nitrogen um, to produce ammonia to supply their, their needs. Um, but the excess ammonia that's produced has to be released in the urine. So if you're giving too much of the rumen degradable protein, a lot of that's gonna to have to be released in the urine of the animal. And the animal has to expend energy to do that and it contributes to your ammonia nitrate pollution in the environment. Um, and soybean meal, cottonseed meal, unless they're specially heated, um, all are fairly um, good sources of your rumen degradable protein. And studies have shown that we want your rumen degradable protein when it comes to a lactating dairy cow to be about 12% of the total digestible, uh, excuse me, 12% of the total dry matter intake. Um, and nowadays they've found that actually they can drop that down as low as 9% of the dry matter intake, as long as the other kind of protein we, we're gonna talk about has a good ratio of lysine to methionine. Um, without it affecting the milk yield. Okay. And then, so the, so these mic the microorganisms have utilized the protein that you gave, you put in the animal, they've broken down those amino acids, they've broken down that non-protein or that non-protein nitrogen, and they've used that to, you know, grow their bodies and all that. And they pass on a regular basis, they pass out of the rumen into the abomasum where they're killed by the acidity there. And then they're absorbed. The protein from them is absorbed in the intestines, just like the protein we're gonna talk about in a minute, the rumen bypass protein. And it's, it's absorbed in the form of amino acids. Um, and they, these rumen microorganisms have an excellent ratio of lysine to methionine, which we're usually looking for a ratio of three times as much lysine to methionine, okay? And they're high in, high in, generally high in protein. Okay, and then the other type of protein we have is this bypass protein, and it's resistant to degradation in the rumen. The rumen microorganisms weren't able to break it down there, so you didn't get this release of ammonia in the rumen that then has to come out in the urine. Um, and the reason, uh, and instead, the, the bypass protein passes from the rumen into the abomasum where it's broken down by your stomach acids and enzymes. And then it's absorbed as amino acids in the small intestines, which is the form of protein that, you're, that an animal um, actually needs is those amino acids. 
Uh, but again, the, the, we said that the rumen microbial protein, those bodies of those microbes, does the same thing. Um, and the reason why it can be resistant to degradation can be because it's, these proteins are bonded with condensed tannins, such as the case of, you know, if your animals are eating um, bird's foot trefoil or, you know, different kinds of tree leaves and stuff, um, grape leaves, things like that. Um, and also because the, um, the protein may have been heat treated um, so, such as in a heat treated byproduct feed like distillers grain and stuff. And it's really hard to say how much bypass protein is optimum. And it, in some studies, they've shown that going from 2% up to 10% of the total dry matter being bypass protein, you get a linear increase. But it actually seems to have a lot to do with what that ratio of lysine to methionine is. And when I talk about this, we're talking about the optimum amount for milk production. And so some of these, um, some of these bypass protein is not going to have an ideal ratio of lysine to methionine of three to one. Instead, it may be really heavy in lysine or really heavy in methionine. And so that's why it's hard to predict what amount is actually good. Um, but we do know that if you get up above much more than 12%, rumen degradable protein, you get a lot, it, it's not good for the environment as far as you get more of that ammonia release in the urine. And it's not particularly, doesn't seem to be any, have a benefit for milk production and that can actually drop milk production. Okay. So now I'm going and looking at your fermentable fiber in New York forages. And I'm just showing some examples here. And so if we looked at these feeds, and you're welcome to unmute yourselves um, at this point. And if we were looking at our total digestible nutrients here, oops, sorry. And if we were looking at our crude protein here, which of these forages would you like to have like to be feeding your animals? So Rhonda, which do you think you'd like to feed? So look at your total digestible nutrients and look at your crude protein. What do these feeds look pretty good to you when you look at those two columns? Um, let's see, I would say the, the ZI alfalfa third cut, no, not Bailage. Uh, Maybe the first one. Okay, so that alfalfa hay there, that second or third cut alfalfa hay. Um, Kim, any, any thoughts on which one would be attractive to you if you were looking at TDN and crude protein? When are we feeding them? What stage are they in? Oh, uh, this is, I'm sorry, these would be lactating, lactating animals. Lactating use in early gestation or early, you know, coming up to peak lactation. And the same thing with the, with the goats. Yeah, so I'm going to use my uh, resident extension agent's comment here and go with the uh, second cut dairy grass hay at the bottom. Okay. Okay. So it was, um, it was actually very similar as far as the TDN and the crude protein to that CL second cut hay, second cut alfalfa hay. They're both pretty similar. They're both 63, 65% um, um, total digestible nutrients and about 16.4% crude protein. So what, why, what was the difference between what Rhonda did and you did? Why do you think Rich was pointing you towards the dairy grass hay? Uh, well, the balance of the protein uh, being suitable for dairy I was actually trying to ask him whether it was dairy or what animals during that. So I didn't hear everything she said. Um, and then, you know, from what my brain has to offer, the 65 on the TDN looks better to me too. Okay, then the 63. Okay, all right. So if you then look at fermentable fiber, which 
I didn't ask either of you to look at, I said to ignore it pretty much. When you look at fermentable fiber, and we were saying in the slide before this, I think, uh, where did I go? Somewhere in there, we were saying that um, for a you nursing, a single, you wanted at least 22% fermentable fiber. Mm -hmm. And for you, for a, and then if she's nursing three, you wanted more like 30% fermentable fiber. So you can see that the alfalfa here, both of these alfalfas here, and especially the alfalfa baleage are really lacking in fermentable fiber. Mm -hmm. They're pretty much just begging for rumen acidosis or for ketosis issues and stuff. Okay, at, versus if you look at this uh, second cut dairy grass hay, it's really, it really, it's really high in fermentable fiber. So not only does it have a really good TDN and a really good crude protein, but it really has this high um, fermentable fiber. So that's a big problem we have with alfalfa hay is that it's low in fermentable fiber. The stems on it are very indigestible, which is why the animals often lead those stems. The stems are often highly lignified for the same stage of maturity as compared to grass stems of the same maturity. Okay. So I'm gonna look at this farm now, which was using baleage. This is actually baleage, a few, um, the previous year's baleage, I believe here. All right, yeah, it is the previous year baleage. And it has um, this 26% crude protein here. Um, it's adjusted still 26%. So there's obviously some heat damage or something going on in here as well. Um, it's got an adjust, uh, the NDF is 35%. Uh, one thing I wanna point out is it's got a degradable protein as a percentage of the crude protein is 82%. So if we take 82% of 66, we're gonna get, or excuse me, 82% of um, 26 we're going to get something that's a lot higher than the 12% level I said was optimum. Um, so this farm that we'll be talking about, this was the forage they had available to them. And this was the grain they had available to them that they were feeding. And they had added corn into this grain to try and bring the protein down because they felt like the baleage was so high in protein. So they were um, feeding, it was 14.6% crude protein. Um, and we'll go on to the next slide. One thing I should point out here is when you look at the lysine and methionine level of this baleage here, um, down at the very bottom, it's, um, it is that three, it is almost that three to one ratio. So it's, it's as far as, um, it, in a way it would be nice if it did bypass that rumen and got to the um, got to got to the stomach intact because it it's a pretty perfect level ratio of uh, ratio. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at those two feeds here using our formula for creating um, um, fermentable fiber. Okay, and so um, when we when we look at this. You've got this, um, as we said, this really high TDN of 65%, which is real positive. You've got, you're feeding excessive uh, protein. And then if you look closer at the protein, you're feeding way more digest degradable protein, rumen degradable protein than you need. So you're gonna get quite a flush of ammonia into that urine. Um, and um, so you're not doing the environment any help. Um, and you're, you're causing a lot of extra energy loss from that animal just getting rid of that urine. Um, and then we, as we said, the, the fermentable fiber here is, is way below that 22% level that we wanna see just for low milk production and for high milk production where we're wanting to see 30%, it's pretty low for that as well. Um, and then the grain that's being used with it rather than being a grain, that helps adjust for things. Um, the grain is, um, is, is 
has even less fermentable fiber in it. And so this farm, um, I was asked to consult uh, consult the the cheese or the plant that was making cheese from this milk. Asked me to consult. They were saying that this farmer is getting really good volume of milk, but we're getting a horrible cheese yield from his milk. And when we finally took a separate bulk tank sample of his milk versus the you know the milk from all the farms we were buying from, the so, the milk solids, both the fat and the protein, were way down. Um, and I I think like I think the protein was like barely hovering at two. Oh. And so instead we went in, Mike, to, um, I consulted with Mike Tony and we used a mixture that he had available that one of the mills was already had on hand um, that we, we've, you, we've used for some other goat dairies um, that was high in fermentable fiber. Uh, it was still, it ended up being higher in crude protein than we had hoped for. Uh, we had formulated it to be less than this, but it came out at 16.6. Um, but you can see that right away, you have a lot more potential for improving your fermentable fiber. So we got rid of the dairy goat grain and instead went to this goat pellet. And then it turned out the farmer, when I was there with him, um, he had a, he had a, he had a bunch of first cut grass hay there. And I was saying, oh, who are you feeding that to? And he said, well, I'm feeding that to my yearlings um, that I haven't, that are just pregnant. I, um, I'm feeding that to them. And he goes, I tried using it for bedding for the milkers, but the milkers kept eating it. So I couldn't use it for bedding. And I went, wait a minute, the milkers are trying to solve the problem for you. Um, and I was aware Years earlier at Lively Run Goat Dairy, we had had a problem with really low protein um, in the milk and again, low cheese yield because of that. And Peter Van Seuss had come in and said, um, and we were feeding alfalfa hay and then we were feeding a grain ration that was essentially whole corn, three quarters whole corn and what one, one quarter of a protein supplement that, that they used to make, I think it's still available called Bucks Mount. Um, and, um, and he said, you know, you need more fermentable fiber. You need more, fiber, you know, more good fiber here. And so he had us feeding a first cut grass hay um, in there. Now, Rich might say that after a little while, the animals might get sick of that first cut grass hay. Um, here, I think because the, here it did help solve the protein issue because it was substantially lower in protein. So I think that's one reason the animals really went for it. Um, it, in general. And so that was what we did with this farm. And then we sat, I sat down with him and balanced the ration and we came out with how much he should be feeding. What had been happening is he was actually upping that dairy goat grain higher than three pounds a day in a desperate effort to try and figure out why his milk, why, why the creamery was so upset with him. You know? And he, was, he kept saying to me, but I'm getting so much milk. I'm getting so much milk, um, but his animals were subclinical for for you know acidosis. I would suspect, um, and then the following in September, um, he was using he had um, another mill, the same mill that was now making this fermentable fiber feed for him, um, pellet for him. Um, did an analysis on his baleage and they were sort of shocked. They went, oh my gosh, you know, your ba this, this baleage is 26% crude protein. We need to add more corn to your grain to bring your protein down. And, it, and I was like, no, 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 it'll be the exact same thing that happened before. Um, and I said, do you still have that first cut? Hey, and he, got, and he was saying, well, actually, um, I, I, I do, but I have my, the cutting from this year and I haven't brought it over to this barn yet. And so he, he brought that over and he started feeding that. And it was the same thing where they ate it voraciously as well as eating the baleage. Um, and so we, I've seen the same thing happen when people are feeding alfalfa hay. So there's nothing wrong with feeding alfalfa hay but you just have to consider what kind of concentrate you're gonna feed with it. Um, this concentrate, this Pine Creek dairy goat grain might be a really good ration to feed 
if what you've got available to you is a first cut or a second cut grass hay that's high in fermentable fiber, but low in crude protein and, and fairly low in um, TDN, you know, this would be a great grain to feed then. But in this case, feeding a grain that's high in fermentable fiber, um, a grain that's high in byproduct feeds like soy hulls and wheat mids is a much better idea. That's a much better match for alfalfa hay. Okay. And then I'm just quickly going to go into interactions between minerals um, and um, just things to watch out for on a forage analysis. So we see here that your copper to molybdenum ratio, if it's lower than two to one, you may see a copper deficiency or molybdenum toxicity in cattle uh, versus if it's higher than 10 to one, increased likelihood of copper toxicity in sheep. So I was um, doing a copper oxide wire particle study at a goat dairy that, um, um, and we went to analyze the, the forage samples. And so we looked at the forage samples and we happened to look at the copper and molybdenum ratio. And in part, the only reason I looked is because I knew we were feeding copper, you know, copper oxide wire particles to these goats. And, um, and so I was worried about, you know, excessive copper. And we looked here and I realized, wait a minute, we've got a copper to molybdenum ratio that's less than two to one. Uh, it's 1 1.6 to one in this first cut from field three. And then it's actually one, it's even lower, it's 1.2 to one um, when we looked at the second field. And this farm actually fed a pretty good amount of copper in their trace mineral, but it was, it was difficult for me in that this farm was buffered for copper because they had a lot of molybdenum in the, um, in the forage they were feeding. Um, they were, they were safe to feed more copper in their, in their concentrate feed or as a copper oxide wire particle. And, um, and so I, had, I was hoping to use their information for other farms, but it's actually very unusual for forage to have a copper to molybdenum ratio that's this low. Um, so it's always good to look at these levels here. Um, and see if you have any extra surprises going on. Um, and then I'm going to stop, I think, with that um, and, um, and close out now. Uh, so let me see if I can hit escape and then come back to our main screen. How do I stop sharing? <laughs> Okay, stop share. Okay, all right. So, so um, do people have any questions, any thoughts there? Uh, Betsy, this was wet chemistry. Thanks, I'm having a, you're coming through very jerky. So I was just chatting in my questions instead. Is there any difference between uh, if you have a really the same feed done as a baleage versus dry hay in the fermentable fiber? Um, yeah, it, it, baleage tends to be low in fermentable fiber in general, okay. and then it also tends to be very high in di in in degradable in rumen degradable protein. You know that that's a problem with baleage, is that baleage tends to be pretty high in. Um, okay. Even yeah. grass baleage? E even grass baleage uh, is, is higher in degradable protein than if you took that same um, forage and made it into a hay. So that's why baleage is not always a great, for, for lactating animals that you're trying to push production on, you know, that you have that temptation to go, oh, I want to feed a really, a really high TDN feed that, you know, sol feed that's really high in soluble carbohydrates with that. And that's usually the wrong thing to do. Um, 
It, it depends on your baleage. A lot, a lot, you have grass baleage that'll be very reasonable at times, you know, but, it, but, it, but in general, it'll be a little higher, um, but your alfalfa baleage particularly can be problematic. And again, these were third, fourth cuttings of, ba of alfalfa baleage. Any other questions or thoughts? No, but I'd love a copy of your, a PDF of your uh, PowerPoint because of, you've got all the ratios and the formulas all in one spot, which is kind of nice. Sh Shannon, when did you get on here? Were you able to understand any of this? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, could I understand some of it? Yes, <laughs> some of it. Um, well, I, I've heard Rich speak um, twice now, I believe, in detail, and that always helps. And I've communicated uh, with Mike Tony over the years many times. So slowly, slowly, I'm starting to catch on more, but it's really complicated. <laughs> And, and how about you, Rhonda and Jacob? Um, I agree, it's complicated. And I think it takes iterations of, uh, of um, going over this stuff to, for it to absorb. So, but yes, I, I, I bits of it, I'm like, Yes, I understand that. I remember that, but um, but I'll be looking at the recording again. <laughs> and we, and one we, thing with that mo copper molybdenum ratio um, for for those fields, that same farm on the soil samples was really high in phosphorus, extremely extremely high in phosphorus. In part because they'd done a lot of grazing of poultry, and also they had just been putting. Their manure, they, they had been doing, taking a really, really, really good, doing a really good job of taking care of their fields and putting their compost manure back on there and stuff. So Rich, Rich or Betsy, do either of you know whether a super high phosphorus would contribute to that molybdenum um, copper ratio being, you know, that copper to molybdenum ratio being so low, the, the molybdenum being pretty high there? Any, any thoughts? I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't answer that. Yeah. I we have a lot of data in our office and I can look at that and I know that I've seen some soils that seem uh, or forage samples that seem high in molybdenum, but I I've I've, uh, I've never tried to connect anything to anything else. Yeah. I did thoroughly enjoy your presentation and learned from it. So thank you. I went I went through things really fast because I'm I'm not well prepared. And we all know I'm not a nutritionist and, and it makes me really nervous to talk about nutrition. I I do believe a lot in fermentable fiber just because with goats, I, I came off of a lot of farms that fed, you know, goat dairies that fed a lot of alfalfa and had a lot of ketosis issues and always seemed on the verge of, of acidosis, you know? Um, and, and our reaction was to feed more and more grain to try and solve things at times. And then you would get that really bad fat depression, better fat depression and realize, oh, something's wrong here. You know, we're doing, we're doing something wrong. Um, so how come we can't get them to do the math for us and print that on our forage analysis? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, part of the problem I think Nico and I are having is that Doug Hogue's values for fermentable fiber are all a little higher than, than what we're getting when we do actual feed analysis. And it seems, you know, Mike Tony had figured out that it was the pectin that he was going through yeah. And put and somehow coming up with estimates of pectin and adding that over, um, and um, so like with wheat mids, 
I mean, nowadays it's really hard to find a wheat mid that would actually be that high in fermentable fiber. And yet we get a really similar, you know, we, we get this, you know, really good reaction in part because there's so much pectin in there as well. So. A couple, a couple of years ago, I sent um, my Tony some spelt hulls because I was asking him, what could I get in my hands on for fermentable fiber? He was saying I needed more. So we sent him that. He had it tested at Dairy One. He came back and said he was so surprised by the quality of the spelt hulls. So that was an interesting uh, find. And sometimes I just happen to have like a gravity wagon full of it. And I, I can confidently feed it to my sheep. You know, they love it. He was asked me, how do you think you're going to get them to eat it? Because <laughs> it's like cardboard and it's all fluffy, but they just gobble it up. But I've never had them, uh, you know, develop acidosis or anything, any problems with the uh, spelt holes. Right. I, I remember looking at that analysis and being very impressed. And then I think um, the the tofu waste stuff is also has nice analysis when it comes to fermentable fiber, too. But, but I think with a lot of these, once people find out about them, they're grabbing them up pretty fast, you know, because mm -hmm. Because you get them, you you get yours from Lake Lake View, right? Or right, like, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jacob and Laura, any any thoughts, any anything, and and then we should cut this. And if you guys have anything else you want to talk about before we quit, and we should also decide if we're going to continue meeting over the summer, or whether this should be our last meeting, um, or what. If we did one more meeting, we might be able to meet um, Nico's baby. Um, but <laughs> Any thoughts, Jacob and Laura? Um, I am very much at the beginning of uh, understanding the analysis, forage analysis. So I need to go over it, looking at the reports that I have to better understand what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. And I have a little table, a little a little spreadsheet for calculating the fermentable fiber. So if any of you want that, I can I can send that out um, and stuff. Um, okay. Yeah. And, uh, all right. I think we, I think we should make flashcards with all the acronyms on them so we can practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I should learn how to pronounce things. I don't know about other people, but I can't pronounce half the things. So. I'm, I'm actually interested in transitioning uh, to baleage, um, mainly for ease of feeding, because I, as I've kind of expanded my flock back to higher numbers, I want to get away from so many square bales. So, um, uh, I guess I'm interested in what, what you had to say and a little bit concerned uh, about what you had to say because uh, I would just kind of assume that it would be higher quality feed and that I wouldn't need to worry so much. The only concern that I kind of had was with listeriosis, especially in warmer weather and wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Well, and, and Laura, are you talking about grass baleage or alfalfa baleage? It would be a mix. Okay. I mean, it would be grass and alfalfa. Okay, because I, I think on the grass, um, um, Rich can probably talk on the grass too, but I think I think you're going to see less of these issues of super high degradable protein and stuff with your grass, grass baleage. But I think a lot of it has to do with what moisture it's, it's, it's harvested at and just, you know, how how good a job is, you know, is done of, of ripening it, you know, of, of fermenting it. Uh, so you would, like, how far are these bales, are, is this baleage from your farm? Would you be producing it or someone else would be? It's from my farm. Somebody else does the work. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, I, I trust that they do a good job and that it's not put up too wet. Um, well, it's also a matter of not being put up too dry. 
you know, there, there's that window of what works, you know. Sure. And, um, yeah. and don't scrimp on the wrap. Let's see yeah. if, it, if it needs to be airtight. Yes. And we know we never fed it until it got below 40. So it was refrigerator temperature outside. Yeah. But, but Betsy, when, when, when Pat Bloomer lost 70% of her kid crop to Listeria, that was in the middle of January. That was in frozen weather. And, and we had one bad it, bout with it also. It, with it had just had not been, yeah, just before it, lambing. It, had it, it hadn't got an acidic in, enough in the, there, there you want lots of that lactic acid production. You know, it, you, you want those, those, those baleage microbes to produce lots of lactic acid. You don't want them to produce a lot of butyric acid. So it's sort of the reverse of what you, you also have to. You also have to manage it. You can't leave old haylage in the bunker laying around because even in spring, like three months later, they'll go digging through that stuff for the sweet spots and have like brown faces and you're wondering what the heck they're eating. So you do need to manage the sort of bunk management with them. Feed bunk. And so, you're, you're, how about how many animals are you feeding? Um, well, I'm going to have a couple of hundred ewes, but that doesn't mean they're all going to be feeding off the same bale, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, they're going to be in groups of probably 35 or 40. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rich, why don't you speak up? A little bit on your experiences with baleage because I think for a lot of large farms it's really the main way to go. Yeah I, I uh, maybe not the very best person personally I've always used dry hay uh, and not baleage. Uh, I do work with farms that use a lot of baleage and we do look at th things on the analysis to make sure that we had good fermentation uh, uh, so there's a VFA score that you can look at on the analysis. That's kind of a report card uh, number. Uh, so I look at that and then I, I do worry about feed out rates. You know, I want that bale, uh, you know, to be eaten within a few days in warm weather. And, and you know, we can stretch it out a little bit more than that in cold weather. So we're not getting spoilage at feed out. Uh, I also look at the, the ash. Uh, you know, there's a lot of soil that was... Uh, you know, if the ash number is really high, there's an increased chance of there being uh, soil contamination, which I think increases the risk of listeria. Is that correct, Tatiana? Yeah. So I and, and, go ahead. And I was going to say the the baleage uh, forage analysis that I showed didn't have didn't have the acetic, propionic, and butyric and lactic listed. Yeah, you know, they didn't have that list there. And and as as um, Rich says, it's it's important to go ahead if you're gonna. It's important to pay that money to have that part of the analysis done. Yeah. So I normally get the VFA score, and I can look yeah. at that. And if the VFA score isn't great, uh, you know, then I might have a fermentation analysis done. And Dairy One, I think, typically keeps enough of the your sample there that if you uh, you know, call them up within a few days. You don't have to send more sample. They probably have enough there and they can do the next uh, test for you. At least that's my understanding of it. What number are you looking for in the VFA? Well, I, I'd like to see it in, you know, above five. It, it's, on, it's on the fact sheet. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I read the fact sheet and then I went back over mine and I remember the farmer telling me he was really pointed because they hadn't run a VFA on it. Um, and so I had another Amish farmer who just had one done that did have a VFA done on it because he was worried. Um, he'd had a few abortion issues and he was wondering if it was related, but his it came out really nice. It came out, um, the score was good. So, um, I'll, unless anyone has any questions, I'll go ahead and shut off the recording. And um, 